pleasure uh, to uh, be at this meeting with all of you guys. And I'm just going to emphasize what we've already heard. We've evolved on a planet that spins on its axis every 24 hours. And so I believe that every element of our biochemistry and our metabolism has been tuned to, to survive and, uh, and procreate and maintain our species. The better our biochemistry and metabolism is synchronized to the daily changes in light, dark, temperature, humidity, and other uh, cycling uh, environmental uh, cues, the better that you know we are. The more likely we are to do well, and so I also will mention uh, what has already been alluded to, and that is that s chronic sleep disruption or chronic desynchrony from the solar day leads to increased risks of many uh, kinds of cancer, uh, changes in autoimmune function, uh, mood disorders, as we'll hear about tomorrow. Uh, and other uh, pain uh, phenotypes and so on and so forth. So, so if we can understand sleep and help people sleep better or more efficiently, um, this could have profound consequences for human health, uh, not in the way that we think of treating Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's where the horse is already out of the barn, but rather improving people's wellness through, uh, and health through uh, improved sleep quality. <clears throat> and. Uh, I'm going to focus on adv advanced sleep phase today, although in collaboration with Ingwe Fu and others, we've worked on other phenotypes, and Ingwe will have something to say about natural short sleep. Well, it was impossible to study the, ge and I want to convince you today of the awesome power of human genetics, which was, could not be applied uh, to, to the circadian system because there were no normal variants, genetic variants of, this, uh, of the circadian system that had been recognized until we published a paper in 1999. So 20 years ago, that we f I first became interested in going after a behavioral trait, sleep behavior, circadian behavior, uh, because this family looked uh, like it was conducive to mapping and cloning. And so that was in 1999, a little more than 20 years ago, where we reported three families, we had inpatient studies and showed that everything we could measure uh, was shifted, but that sleep quality and quantity were, uh, were the same as you know, the average in the general population. Now, I'm a huge believer in, in model systems, and we've learned a tremendous amount from Drosophila and, and uh, mice, zebrafish, as we've already heard today, um, and the core of the clock, and I'm not going to go into the details, but the f most basic fundamental of this transcriptional translational negative feedback loop are uh, uh, BMOL and clock, and PER and TIM in the case of Drosophila, or PER and CRY in the case of uh, mammalian systems. But when we started this project, none of these human genes was cloned, and, and there was very little uh, human genome sequence database uh, human gen genome sequence in the database. And so when, when we published this first gene in that large Utah pedigree, this was done by brute force positional cloning, but it did turn out to be a homologue of the period uh, gene from Drosophila. And be, each subject that we study, and I, I don't call these patients, these are for the most part normal variants, although extreme variants of the circadian system. These people wake up very early and they go to sleep very early. And each genetic variant that causes this phenotype allows us an opportunity to learn something about regulation of the clock and uh, uh, regions of the protein that didn't have any uh, recognized importance. And it, the first mutation in PER2 occurred uh, at this serine residue, and it was a mutation to a glycine. And we've done extensive biochemical work uh, to show that phosphorylation of this site leads to a cascade of phosphorylations of four additional serines downstream. And uh, by the way, we also have an unpublished mutant of the second serine in this register in another FASP family. <clears throat> this was also uh, uh, in the early days in uh, uh, the second gene that we identified uh, was a, a novel variant in casein kinase 1 delta. And uh, Terry Toe went on to show that this region of PER2 that I showed you, uh, that, that this phosphorylation cascade is by casein kinase uh, 1 delta. 
This Syrian is a priming event for this cascade, and we and uh, David Vership have independently shown that the priming kinase is CK1 epsilon, uh, delta also, but this is a non-canonical site and therefore provides an interesting uh, biochemical target for developing jet lag drugs. Now, our entire focus along the way has been on the circadian phenotype in these individuals, but th this collect large collection of families we have now has turned out to be a, a cornucopia of other interesting things. In general, these FASP individuals are healthy and happy. Rarely people will complain about their phenotype. Say, I don't like waking up when it's cold, dark, and lonely. And in those situations, we would call that a sleep disorder. But for most FASP people, it's not a disorder at all, but an extreme variant uh, of circadian regulation. So here's that interesting cascade that we've spent so much time uh, characterizing and focusing on, and I'll uh, have a little bit more to say about that in a moment. What was interesting about this region is that contrary to all the work that had been done up to this time in cell culture and in, uh, and in uh, vivo and flies, for example, was that CK1 phosphorylation targeted PER2 for degradation leading to lower protein levels and shorter period. Remarkably, the, the mutation in the human FASP family leads to increased transcription of PER2, higher protein le levels in longer period. And while this seems seemed counterintuitive to me at first that nature would be fighting with itself, doing t opposite things uh, when the same kinase phosphorylates different sites. Uh, we, uh, I, I, I've come to appreciate that perhaps this is part of the homeostatic mechanisms where fine-tuning of this balance can help to really fine-tune a critically important uh, biological process like uh, uh, circadian timing. Work from Ing Wei's lab uh, first showed that GSK3 beta is a mammalian circadian gene. It was known to be a, a Drosophila gene before that. But this uh, work from Chris Takashik in Ing Wei's lab was really quite remarkable. Of, of the 400 putative substrates identified in this chemical genetic approach to study GSK3 beta, two of the novel targets are ogluknac transferase and ogluknase. These are enzymes that either add or remove an O-linked glycosylation, a, 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 a gluknac moiety from serine and threonines in target proteins. UDP gluknac levels change dramatically with nutritional status, and thus it is considered a nutritional uh, nutrient sensor uh, because it, it is the byproduct of glucose and amino acid metabolism. Less than 25% of those substrates identified in that chemical genetic screen are known GSK3 beta substrates. So GSK3 beta, although heavily studied, is doing much more than we really understand. But without showing you any of the data, I do want to tell you that using mass spec, Krista in collaboration with Al Burlingame's lab here at UCSF, show that OGT and OGA are competing for O-linked glycosylation of, this, of the very same serines that are phosphorylated by CK1. And that, uh, and that glycosylation here, increasing glycosylation here, has the same effect of having a glycine residue here and hypophosphorylation. So these two processes are competing, and, and hence this is a whole another layer of biochemical re regulation that's critically important to, to timing of the circadian clock. And as, uh, as I mentioned, we've uh, done a small molecule screen looking for, uh, and we have a number of compounds that both increase and decrease phosphorylation of serine 662 uh, at this non-canonical CK1 delta site, which we would uh, love to carry forward in terms of uh, trying to develop uh, jet lag drugs, and, and small molecules that increase phosphorylation at this site, which, is, which are harder to find, by the way, are the kinds of things that you would want if you were flying to China or Taipei, and ones that inhibit this non-canonical site are the ones that would give you the blue pill uh, if you were flying to Paris and in the other direction. So, so this uh, still has uh, a lot of work to do, but we're hopeful that maybe we can move that forward. 
Now, interestingly, we now have three alleles, uh, three variant alleles in three separate families, uh, three alleles of CK1 delta in families that have FASP and migraine. Now, migraine is very common, so you say, well, that could be coincidental. Well, the co-segregation in three distinct families of these rare variants in CK1 delta genetically proves that these alleles cause the migraine with aura in these families. In addition, uh, work in the T44A mouse, the first CK1 delta, uh, delta mutant allele that we identified, showed that the mice have, with the mutation have a, a significantly decreased level uh, or threshold for inducing cortical spreading depression, which is the physiologic phenomenon underlying my, uh, aura in migraine headache. They also have increased uh, arterial dilatation. This work done using optical intrinsic signal imaging and they also have a phenotype in a peripheral allodynia model that we developed with Alan Bassbaum's lab here at UCSF, uh, which is another physiology that we think is relevant to the complex uh, phenotypes that we see in patients with migraine. And finally, the astrocytes from these uh, mutant mice have uh, increased spontaneous and evoked calcium signaling. So all of this data together argues very strongly that that the CK1 delta mutation that causes FASP also causes migraine with aura. Completely unexpected, but an experiment that you would never, or a finding you would never recognize in a model system because they, uh, the flies and the mice can't tell you that, they're, that, that their head hurts. And whether mice and flies have a migraine-like phenomenon, you know, we could uh, discuss that if you'd like, but we don't know. Another family, and so now at this point we began to sequence all the candidate genes identified from humans, flies, and mice um, for mutations in our growing uh, collection of FASP families. And this small family has a PER3 variant that's quite interesting. They also have a strong seasonal affective disorder trait. It's a small human family, and so we can't say genetically that these mutant, that the variants uh, cause SAD, but that was an interesting hypothesis. And so Loying Zhang, who did this work, made mice carrying the PER3 allele, uh, mutant PER3 allele, and showed that these mice have a circadian phenotype that affects period, but also entrainment. And in addition, we, we can't measure depression in a mouse because we can't talk to it, but there are reasonable measures of depression-like activity in mice. And when Loying subjected the mutant mice to these assays, they had increased measures of depression-like behavior. But the really exciting finding, uh, uh, we thought, was that when she then put these mice into a short photo period in the vivarium, that the measures of, of depression-like behavior worsened. And so we have to be careful about saying that these variants cause uh, seasonal affective disorder, but the data is supportive of this notion, and so there's a lot uh, more work that we'd love to do uh, on this. And so this interesting family that has a PER3 variant, you know, really suggests to us the possibility that PER3, which is the most different of all the PERs, it has a much less strong phenotype when it's knocked out in mice, it's been largely ignored by the, you know, people in the circadian field, we think that it may have evolved to, you know, function at a nexus between sleep and mood regulation. And again, uh, there's a lot more work to do, but an exciting you know, side trip because, uh, because of the recognition that the affected in individuals in this family had very strong seasonal affective disorder. Another small family with a cryptochrome 2 mutation, work done by a ter terrific postdoc who's now back in Japan, um, and, and this provides another link. I'm not going to go through all the data. I'm happy to talk about details with anyone during the break or lunch. But let me summarize what we know about CRY2. CRY2 is a critical, CRY2 along with PER2 are critical to regulating circadian timing. And normally, CRY2 can bind either FBXL3, which, target, which is a E3 ubiquitin ligase, target, targeting it for degradation, but FAD, another important metabolic cofactor, uh, can bind in the CRY2 FAD binding site and compete away FBXL3. So that in the wild type situation, there's a balance of degradation versus stabilization that leads to a normal period. 
We know from others' work that the FBXL3 knockout mice, so they don't have the E3 ligase, um, that these uh, mice accumulate more CRY2, and this leads to a longer circadian period. What ARISA showed in a, in a number of uh, biochemical in vitro and in vivo experiments is that, that because that, that the mutant CRY2 is binding more tightly to FBXL3, that FAD is less effective uh, at uh, competing for the binding at this site, and therefore that there's a faster degradation of the CRY2 protein, lower CRY2 protein levels, which fits in this model with a short period and an advanced phase. Now, timeless was the second fly gene that was cloned in Mike Young's lab uh, in 1994. And again, it's been replaced by CRY1 and 2 in the mammal. It also is embryonic lethal when you knock it out in the fly. And so, again, circadian biologists sort of ignored it uh, because, you, you know, what could you do? Um, more recently, uh, we identified a timeless mutation, and this is work uh, carried forward by Phil Curian. Um, and this timeless mutation, uh, when put into mice, actually causes, uh, does not cause a, a change in period. Many of the mutations we've identified thus far have ch shortened period, which we think is a good way to get phase advance. Um, but this mouse has a completely normal period. And so Phil studied these mice, and let me just show you that here. Uh, first of all, let me say that it, it is an N -term, uh, C terminal uh, truncating mutation that takes out a putative nuclear localization signal. And this leads to cytoplasmic localization of the mutant pro protein uh, uh, as opposed to nuclear, primarily nuclear localization of the wild type timeless protein. <clears throat> So uh, this is, a, 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 I think, a beautiful example of some of the, you know, the things that we have to deal with using human and mouse genetics. Here's a wild-type uh, mouse, and blue is d dark here, so these nocturnal animals are running on the wheel at, when it's dark, and they're not running very much during the light. But again, we didn't see any difference in the mutant mice. But part of the problem is that mice have this very strong masking to light. They do not like to run in the light, presumably an evolutionary adaptation to, uh, to keep them away from their predators or make them less uh, accessible to their predators. And so with the advice of David Weaver at uh, UMass, um, Phil subjected these animals to a skeleton photo period where it's dark all the time except for a 15-minute light pulse at the beginning of what would be the light phase, and a 15-minute pulse at what would be the end of the dark phase, uh, light phase. And the, these mice, and we've shown this by EEG too, by the way, these mice are actually awake during the light phase, but they're not running on the wheel because of this strong masking to, uh, uh, to light in, in, that, in this species. But he's able to uncover this. These mice now are getting up and running, they're phase advanced, just like the human subjects, running in what would be a time they generally don't run, i.e. the light phase, uh, but because he has the lights off. And then again, they get off the wheels when the lights come on because they're masking. Even though they're awake here, they're masking to the light from the, the entraining light pulses. So these mice have a completely normal period. And so we said, well, how could, you know, they have a phenotype, they have a phase advanced phenotype type like the humans, but they don't have it like the PER2 mice because they have a shortening of their circadian period. And so he subjected these mice to light pulses at ZT14 and ZT22 and showed that they had very dramatically different uh, strength of entrainment to these entraining light pulses. And so <clears throat> I'll come back to this in, in kind of a model of how we're thinking about these. Liza Ashbrook, who's here, and Brian Curtis at the University of Utah, along with Chris Jones, um, uh, looked at data from our experience collecting these families for over a decade, uh, well, for a decade's time of the last 20 years, and have now generated prevalence estimates. I'm not going to talk about the details of this, except to say 
that our very, very conservative estimate is that FASP, familial advanced sleep phase, affects at least one in 500 people. Now, a third of our subjects who met the initial screening criteria um, were chose not to participate, and so we think that this is at least 50% less uh, than it would be if we had been able to track down those four families. So the estimate is that FASP is actually affecting somewhere in the, on the order of one in 300 people. So these families are out there uh, and have not been you know, recognized until only 20 years ago because typically they're not seeking out doctor's help and hadn't been recognized. So uh, just to finish up, uh, so how can you get phase advance? Our initial uh, work, PER2, for example, showed, and the human subjects with the PER2 mutation, uh, one subject who was studied in a temporal isolation protocol, they have a short period and that causes them to be phase advanced. But it's theoretically possible, and we think timeless is the first example where a mouse with a completely normal period, a mouse carrying the human mutation, but has altered sensitivity to entrainment by light, that this is an alternate pathway to the same downstream phenotype of phase advance. Remember that the forward screens in mouse and flies have focused on period, looking for arrhythmia or short or long periods. That, we can't do that in humans. We're looking at phase, which is a slightly different phenotype, but it's also going to allow us to identify different effects. And in fact, um, we know now that uh, of the mutants that we uh, have, all of these are published except CK1 Epsilon so far, of all the mutants that we've published, they affect period and or entrainment. And we think theoretically that altered uh, output coupling of the, a normal clock with a normal entraining mechanism could also uh, give phase advance. But we expect that in the large collection of families we have that are unexplained that we may be uh, finding novel clock genes that haven't yet been, been identified, but more likely novel entrainment genes and possibly output coupling genes. I've, I've t told you very briefly about how in individual families, specific genes can lead to other phenotypes, suggesting you know, what we believe to be true, that the clock is integrated with all elements of physiology. And uh, in a recent uh, sequencing effort where we looked at 34 unexplained families, we identified seven and six families with six different mutant alleles in each of two new and novel circadian genes. And work, the genetic data is incontrovertible. They're with seven, six, seven alleles uh, in different families with the same phenotype, this proves that these mutations in these genes cause FASP. And we're in the process of, uh, at least for the first one, uh, doing in vitro uh, physiology as well as uh, generating mouse models to to uh, see if we can recapitulate the phenotype in mice. So there's still a huge amount to do. Less than 15% prior to the sequencing, less than 15% of all of our families have mutations in the known circadian genes. So the human organism is gonna allow us to find, uh, uh, we think, a number of novel genes moving forward. And then I'll just close by acknowledging folks who I've mentioned along the way. Ing Wei Fu, my longtime collaborator, and uh, lots, uh, lots of other gr uh, great collaborators, some who are here, and. Uh, some who are not. So, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Hi, uh, thank you. Um, I was very uh, interested to hear you say that um, familial advanced sleep phase um, uh, may be present in one out of 300 uh, people, uh, but it looks like those uh, prevalence estimates were based on a sleep clinic population. Yes, yeah, so I, I sorry, I, in 20 minutes I was trying to give a high level view. The, most sleep clinics, as you know, are OSA, and so these are mostly, it's not general population, it's obstructive sleep apnea. Okay. But we had Terry Young look at her populate, true Wisconsin population-based study and she showed that there was no association between OCA and chronotype, which made us think that I, I wouldn't, I, that's why we say it's a prevalence estimate. Uh, we, we're not saying it, that it is the prevalence because it's not a, it's far from perfect if, you, if we were doing a prospective population-based study. 
But the fact that there's no association with chronotype and OSA, we think it's a very reasonable population to use as a surrogate for general population. Uh, so my uh, follow-up question to that was whether uh, you are looking at or, or considering uh, looking at data from some of these consumer-oriented genetic, you know, like 23andMe or, or similar um, you know, yeah, I, I had talked with Linda like Avey and, and Ann Wojcik, Ingwe as well, early uh, in 23andMe days, and we helped them get all the questionnaires set up for the chronotype stuff, hoping that we would get to analyze the data, and they've published papers on that now. That So, so it's being done, but um, uh, uh, there are others, and we'll hear from Risha Saxena, who's doing a, a lot of beautiful work with the Welcome Trust Collection, which is also a huge uh, popular, uh, a huge number of individuals. Well, so Thomas. Do you there's no real mouse model for migraine? Because there are these characteristics, I mean, light sensitivity and nausea, nausea that would be sporadic. Yeah, no, no, no. There, I, I, it's, that's not to say that there aren't things that we can measure that we think are relevant and perhaps associated with migraine. But I, I'm reluctant to say that our mice have migraine because I can't prove that they have headache. <laughs> right. I, I, there are, the, there's a whole constellation of... of no, absolutely. And, and uh, cortical spreading depression thresholds, arterial uh, reactivity, uh, you know, calcium imaging and astrocytes, this peripheral allodynia model that we developed, all of these I think are reasonable and there are others that others have, have uh, worked on. You haven't looked at those in your... <clears throat> Yep. We sent some mice to a woman at the University of Iowa who's going to look at a light sensitivity, but I haven't heard anything back about it. sporadic, I guess. Yeah, I, I just want to be conservative because, you know, I, I, I object when people say this mouse is depressed, this mouse has a headache, this mouse has OCD. We can look at things that we think are reasonable surrogates for those phenotypes, but we can't really say that they have that phenotype because we can't talk to them. Um, I have a follow-up question and addressing, would like to address the common variants. So is there any indication that um, there is for allelic series in these, uh, um, in these genetic factors? So do you find uh, common variants uh, related to chronotypes in any of the GVAS? We haven't done that at all, but Risha will be talking about that tomorrow. And as you would expect, as I expected, uh, a lot of the hits turn out to be in circadian genes where we find variants or where, you know, knockout in a mouse or fly or forward genetic screen causes a, a circadian phenotype. Uh, but, you know, there, as with all GWAS studies of complex behavior, you get many hits across the genome, some that aren't near any known circadian genes. And so the challenge, of course, with GWAS studies is how do you get from a statistical association which doesn't say anything about causation. You know, a lot of people say, oh, it's the gene next door. Well, this variant could be affecting a gene two million base pairs away, right? So the, ch the real challenge with following up on GWAS studies is trying to get from the, the statistical association to the actual genetic uh, pathway that's being influenced and the protein that uh, ultimately is being uh, uh, affected. And, and that's, you know, a very, very hard problem. But, I think Risha will have more to say about that tomorrow. In your CK1 Delta um, variant genotype mice, um, were there any metabolic changes that, that's been found? You know, there, we would like to look at all phenotypes in all mouse models that we've generated, but, you know, we just, there's way, way, way too much work to do. We're interested in looking at that um, or, you know, finding a, you know, some, what I'd love to do is, is, you know, grow up a huge colony of all of our mutant lines and then in a large consortium put them through testing over two or three years' time measuring body weight and immune measures and learning in memory and mortality, uh, you know, what cancers develop in the wild type versus the mutant mice. But as you know, those kinds of studies would, you know, it would require... Yeah, we may one day do that. I would love to do that, but they would be incredibly expensive and would require collaboration with a big group of people with many different types of expertise. Philippe. I may have missed that, but in your first three mutants, 
I may have missed that, but it's a sleep symposium and you were talking about PER3 linking sleep to mood. What's the sleep phenotype of those mutants or of those families? Just like mood, usually people think about sleep restrictions, fragmentation, it's just like he has a phase, is are locked, right? So you sleep happens at the, maybe not at the right time, but still everything else is like, you know, pretty much Yeah, they, so they have a period What's mutant. Wrong? They have, a, uh, they have a, a change in tau, in period. But they all, but like the, oh man, I get them all mixed up now. The PER3 and the CRY2 mice have, the, the mutations when put into mice affect the period, but they also affect entrainment. So, you know, in tr clock ticking in your brain, if this is the Venn diagram with, and these are the proteins and genes involved, and these are the genes and proteins involved in entrainment, they have to overlap some, right? And I think PER3 and CRY2 probably do that because they have both period and entrainment phenotypes, but there are going to be genes that only affect entrainment and don't affect core clock function or core clock ticking. There is misalignment. Yes. Yeah.